again, thank you, Philippine Pediatric Society, Northern Luzon Chapter, for inviting me to give a talk on pediatric bone health. The human skeleton undergoes several changes in size and shape during the different stages of life. Bone appears in the six-week-old embryo and growth of bone continues in adulthood. But it is very important to note that during the period of childhood and adolescence, that rapid and significant longitudinal bone growth, aerial bone expansion, and bone mineral accrual materialize. 90% of the peak bone mass is achieved in late teenage, and the amount of bone mass reached by this age predicts bone mineral density in adulthood. Bone mineral content, or BMC, is a measure of the amount of minerals mostly calcium and phosphorus contained in a bone, while bone mineral density is derived using bone mineral content divided by area of bone being measured. The concept is mass of mineral per volume of bone. And volumetric bone mineral density together with bone size delineates our bone mass, which is a key determinant of bone strength. The accrual of bone mass markedly increases during childhood and puberty. It peaks between the ages of 9 to 14 years so that by age 18 in girls and 20 in boys, kids have already developed 90% of their lifetime bone mass, which makes youth the best time for our kids to invest in their bone health. Optimization of peak bone mass requires the proper interaction of environmental, dietary, hormonal, and genetic influences. A complex interplay of these different factors determines skeletal development, and a greater effort is needed to identify the critical factors that establish peak bone strength so that optimization of skeletal health during growth is allowed. Genetic factors play a significant role in determining bone mass. It has been known for many years that height and other anthropometric variables related to skeletal size are highly heritable. Population ancestry differences in bone mineral density in children also support a strong genetic component of bone accretion during childhood. Studies have shown that bone mineral density is greatest for African, Americans, and Caucasians have greater values than Asians. And lastly, early bone health may be compromised by several genetic disorders. Osteogenesis imperfecta is the best example of these disorders with a spectrum of problems that includes low bone mass, chronic bone pain, recurrent fractures, and skeletal deformity. As a pediatrician, I believe that identifying genetic factors that affect peak bone mass is a critical step in developing early and effective interventions for the prevention of osteoporosis or fractures that may happen later in life. Although growth hormone is responsible for longitudinal bone growth, it also plays an important role in building and maintaining bone mineral density and in altering bone architecture throughout life. Growth hormone, by acting directly and by stimulating insulin-like growth factor 1, is essential for achieving peak bone mass. In the growth plate, IGFs promote clonal expansion of chondrocytes at the proliferation zone and cellular maturation of prehypertrophic chondrocytes. During bone modeling and remodeling, IGFs enhance osteoblastogenesis and promote matrix deposition and mineralization. 
growth hormone deficiency during childhood and puberty may compromise accrual of bone mass and formation of normal bone architecture because a significant amount of bone mass is achieved by the end of puberty. This is one of the reasons why we can never overemphasize the importance of growth monitoring. The assessment of height and not just the weight of our patients is the best indicator of child growth as well as general health. We measure patients' heights and weights over time and we must evaluate the pattern of their growth by plotting of heights and weights on the growth curve. A single height or weight measurement only identifies children whose height and weight is outside the normal range for their age. However, repeated height measurements over time during their follow-ups allow for calculation of a growth velocity and can find abnormal growth patterns in terms of a crossing of the height sentence thereby identifying abnormality through the pattern of growth within the individual. In addition to their reproductive functions, sex steroids influence skeletal physiology, at least in part by acting directly on both cells via their classical receptors for estrogens or androgens. Sex steroids play an important role in bone growth and the attainment of peak bone mass and positively influence bone growth, maintenance, and maturation. Estrogens, mainly 17 beta estradiol, are essential for the maintenance of the balance between bone formation and bone resorption. Androgens, on the other hand, favor periostal bone formation in men and maintain trabecular bone mass and integrity. The net result of these sex steroid hormone functions leads to an accrual in bone formation. Adult patients with untreated abnormal pubertal development during puberty have osteopenia or reduced bone mass compared with treated patients. The persistent osteopenia in adulthood results from inadequate bone mineral accrual during puberty and or abnormal bone remodeling after puberty. Therefore, it is very vital that abnormal pubertal development must be recognized early and addressed properly to optimize the bone health of this group of children. The growth and development of our bones requires an adequate supply of many different nutritional factors. Of the individual nutrients, particular attention has been paid to protein, calcium, and vitamin D. Protein is one of the nutritional factors involved in the process of bone mineralization since bone is largely consists of inert matter minerals and proteins. The protein component is composed of collagen type 1 and other matrix proteins. Hence, Protein under nutrition are usually accompanied by a lower mass, muscle mass, and bone, mainly due to a reduction in bone structure protein. On the other spectrum of malnutrition, recent studies suggest that adiposity or obesity may be detrimental to the development of bone strength parameters and bone mass accrual during growth. Obesity in childhood has been increasing worldwide for the past decades and according to Global Health Observatory data in 2016, 18% of children aged 5 to 19 years old worldwide were overweight or obese. Previous studies found that children and adolescents with obesity have bone mineral content higher than normal weight peers, and body adiposity represents a mechanical load which is beneficial for bone accrual, indicating that the adipose tissue exerts a positive effect on bone structure. But on the other hand, it has been reported that obesity imposes several destructive mechanisms to bone health that favors bone frailty. 
both adipocytes and osteoblasts are derived from multipotent mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs. And obesity drives the differentiation of MSCs toward adipocytes at the expense of osteoblast differentiation. Secondly, obesity that is often characterized by reduced levels of physical activity promotes osteoclast activity and bone resorption, triggering the expression of receptor activator or of nuclear factor or RAMK. RAMK is expressed on monocytes and macrophages and constitution of monocytes and macrophages and their differentiation into osteoclast ultimately leading to increased bone resorption. Also, adipocytes in bone marrow microenvironment release a number of pro-inflammatory and immunomodulatory molecules that upregulate formation and activation of osteoclasts, thus ensuing a poorer bone quality. Furthermore, hyperinsulinemia, which is the dysregulated insulin secretion and or clearance of insulin due to chronically elevated insulin that is commonly associated with obesity, acts on osteoblasts causing reduced bone formation. It also decreases the number of osteoclasts and markers of bone resorption. The final result, obesity is associated with poor bone quality. These are pictures of obese children presenting with acanthosis ligricans, a continuous sign of hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance. It is characterized by darkening and thickening or hyperkeratosis of the skin, occurring mainly in the folds of the skin in the armpit, growing, and back of the neck. Calcium and vitamin D, D play critical roles in mineralization of bone. Calcium is the most common mineral in the human body. About 99% of the calcium in the body is found in bones and teeth, while the other 1% is found in blood and soft tissues. Calcium concentrations in the blood must be maintained within a very narrow concentration range to preserve normal physiological functions such as muscle contraction, nerve impulse contraction, constriction, and relaxation of blood vessels. Because these functions are very essential, the body will demineralize bone to maintain normal blood calcium concentrations when calcium intake is inadequate. In response to low blood calcium, parathyroid hormone or PTH is secreted by the parathyroid gland and it targets three main access in order to restore blood calcium concentration. Bone resorption is induced, filtered calcium is retained by the kidneys, and vitamin D is activated. Thus, it is important that children, including as adults, must obtain enough calcium from food to limit bone resorption in response to fluctuating blood calcium concentrations. The established recommended daily allowances for the amounts of calcium required for bone health and um, to maintain adequate rates of calcium retention in healthy people, people are listed in this table in milligrams per day. And the dietary sources of calcium are as follows. Next, we have vitamin D. Vitamin D plays a role in bone mineralization by maintaining adequate serum levels of calcium and phosphorus, which allow osteoblasts to build bone matrix. The active form of vitamin D promotes calcium and phosphorus absorption in the small intestine, calcium reabsorption in the kidneys, increased osteoblast activity, as well as reduced osteoclast activity. Most vitamin D is produced naturally in the skin from exposure to sunlight and less than 10% is obtained orally from cons consumption of vitamin D-rich foods or supplements. 
the estimated average requirement for vitamin D of children 0 to 12 months is 400 IU per day and 600 IU per day for children more than one year of age. But the bottom line is regular sun exposure is the most natural way to get enough vitamin D. However, darker skinned people need to spend um, longer in the sun than lighter skinned people to produce the same amount of vitamin D. Now, the vitamin D produced from, from sunlight or the digestively absorbed form is biologically inert and requires activation by two sequential hydroxylation reactions, the first occurring in the liver and the second in the kidneys. In the liver, vitamin D25 hydroxylase converts vitamin D to 25 hydroxyvitamin D or calcidiol, and this compound is subsequently converted in the kidneys by 25 hydroxyvitamin D31 alpha hydroxylase enzyme to 125 dihydroxyvitamin D or calcitriol. It is this final form that is biologically active. Hence, this vitamin, which actually acts as a hormone, it is a hormone, is very essential in optimizing pediatric bone health. Vitamin K is a multifunctional vitamin which has gained the spotlight for its efficacy for enhancing bone turnover. Vitamin K promotes bone formation by increasing the level of some bone formation markers and regulating the extracellular matrix mineralization. Vitamin K2 is primarily bacterial in origin and found in animal-based foods such as cheese, cheese curd, fermented foods, egg yolk, whole milk, and in fatty meats and yogurt. And lastly, we have physical activity, which is also one of the modify, modifiable factors that can enhance bone accretion. Mechanical strain imparted by muscle action is responsible for the um, development of the external size and shape of the bone and ultimately bone strength. The intrinsic relationship between muscle and bone has been described by the Mechanstadt theory, which holds that bone mass, size, and strength change predictably and correspondingly with increasing maximal muscle force during growth or in response to increased loading. Weight bearing and um, resistance exercises are the best for the bones. They include walking, um, hiking, jogging, climbing stairs, playing tennis, and dancing. And resistance exercises such as lifting weights can also strengthen bones. Now, many children with chronic and disabling illnesses are at risk of developing osteoporosis as they possess multiple risk factors leading to low bone mineral density, including inactivity, decreased exposure to sunlight, poor nutrition, and use of um, medications or treatment that can lower bone mineral density, such as glucocorticoids and anti-epileptic drugs. Awareness of the increased risk of osteoporosis in these children and routine monitoring for bone health are important as adequate management is only possible by assuring sufficient calcium and vitamin D intake and providing appropriate therapy. With this, I end my lecture with the following key messages. Peak bone mass is strongly influenced by, gen by genetic factors which is a non-modifiable factor, but we can optimize children's bone health only if we minimize the modifiable bone health threats. These are my references, and thank you very much for listening.